Kim, we're good. And it looks like we're live. We're good to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the um, Gorman Learning Charter Network Advisory Council. Um, let's see. So first things first, um, call the meeting to order at 402. And we have advisory council roll call. Uh, Tisha. Present. State your presence. State you're here. Um, Tricia Graham. Here. Is Tricia here? Yeah, I said here. I see Tricia and Blake. We'll come back to you guys. You said here. Okay. Um, Blake Graham Emmerich. Here. Thank you. Uh, Keisha Jackson. Keisha here, no. Um, Linda Lawback. Here. Thank you. Kiwi. Here. Emma Burnett. No, Emma. How about uh, Lisa Corrales? No, Lisa. Um, I'm here, Olivia Duran. Is Emily Middlesetter here? I don't see her on. Kim Pike is not here. Trisha Schroeder? Here. Thank you. And then roll call for the administration. Denise Burchette? Present. Tamara Campbell? Present. Adam Cornish? Present. Kim Tamungbing? Present. Okay, and if we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart as we get the flag up. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's down. Okay, so approval of the agenda. Um, there was two things that were brought to um, our attention for uh, the information discussion action for D and E. If we can change those to information instead of um, discussion and approval, it's more just for presentation. So if we can change those and then approve the agenda with those changes. I move to approve the agenda with those changes. We need a second. I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of approving the agenda with the changes for D and E to become informational instead of uh, review, discussion, and approval, say aye. 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 Are there any nays? Okay, so if it's approved, then um, that's correct, right? We're good to move on? I think you have to go one by one, don't you? The people that are present. You need to go Sorry. one by one? We probably do with this yes. format. Okay, here. so let's, let's vote. Uh, Tisha Clark, do you um, approve the agenda? Aye, with yes. Changes? Thank you. Uh, Trisha Graham. Aye. Blake Graham. Aye. Keisha is not here. Linda. Aye. Kiwi. Aye. Um, I approve it. Emily was not here. Kim was not here. And Trisha. Aye. Okay. And there are no nays. So agenda approved with changes. Uh, are there any communications from the public, Kim? There is not. Um, report and communication to the council by uh, Denise Brichette, the executive director. Hi guys and gals, good to see you all. Um, 
you know, the year's flying by. I can't even believe it's February. Um, so, you know, the year is really flying by. We're getting uh, towards the end. We're home stretch, basically. And, you know, in the next few meetings that we have are going to be, again, those really critical ones that where you're going to help guide decisions made by the school. And so I, I appreciate that, you know, you are all still here. Um, and I just want you to know that, that these are important decisions that we have to make and your input we value um, from all of you. Even, you know, we have Blake, he's our only student um, member, but we value your uh, input, Blake. So thank you for coming back and thank you, Tricia, for bringing, for coming with Blake, because you're a parent too. And so anyways, I just want you guys to know we're excited to get the ball rolling and, and, you know, doing another year with you. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to information discussion and action. And the first one is parent and student communication. Is there anyone on the advisory council um, would like to say anything? No? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to- Actually, I would like to say one thing actually. Okay. Um, I just wanna, since it's related to what we were you know, doing last year, I would just wanted to bring it up and say thank you to Tamara because she put out um, a calendar, a yearly calendar for all the assessments and put it on Parent Square so that we could all see it and so we could know, you know, which tests are coming when and what to expect. And Blake and I really appreciate that. So I just wanted to mention that. Great, thank you. Yes, the staff appreciates it too. We get to know what's, what's coming up. Thank you, Tamara. Any other communication from the council? Okay, so let's move on to B, review and discuss um, discussion of the WASC or Western Association of Schools and College Visit from Adam Cornish. Hi, everybody. Okay, so um, until my screen sharing goes live, a uh, quick overview of this before we get started. A Western Association of Schools and Colleges is uh, the organization that provides accreditation for schools and accreditation um, Long story short of accreditation is that's what lets the, the classes that you take here matter on the transcript when you're taking your transcript to another school. So um, as our graduates leave, they're able to say, these are the courses that I took in high school, they count it. That's what accreditation does for us. The process of gaining accreditation uh, is a really, it's an interesting and involved kind of ongoing process. Um, Gorman Learning Center, Santa Clarita, or San Bernardino, Santa Clarita, uh, was up for the beginning of a, an accreditation term uh, this year. So our initial accreditation uh, ends at this current year and our next term of accreditation begins July 7th. And so what that means for us is this year we had uh, a visit from a committee that reviewed our school, that reviewed our program. Um, we did a lot of work in the lead up to analyze everything that the school is doing to look at the data, to gather documents, to really explain ourselves and to really tell our story so that they're able to write a report, which then the Western Association of Schools and Colleges will use as the basis to determine our accreditation status. So some potential outcomes of that accreditation status we haven't heard yet. Uh, generally speaking, it's uh, between a six year term of accreditation with a visit in the middle of the third year um, and, or like a longer visit in the middle of the third year. And every once in a while, it's we'll come back in a year or we'll come back in two years. Uh, so those are the different ways that we might be looking at this. What the value is of this visit though, beyond just the accreditation, is this is a committee of folks who are in education. They're looking at us with fresh eyes. Uh, they're really trying to assess and analyze and understand the program really thoroughly. And so what, mean, what that means is that they come up with insights and, and ways of seeing things that, um, that might be new to us. Um, they ask us questions that really get us thinking. They, they challenge us to, to 
change like priorities around and things like that. So what I want to do is share with you the key ideas, findings, insights that this committee left us with. Uh, they gave us this, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to use their PowerPoint presentation. Um, and we'll go, I think I'm going to spend most of the time on kind of the overview part of it. Uh, and then I'll briefly go through some of the subdivided, subdivided um, criteria. All right, so now I think I can share a screen. Thank you, Kimberly, so much. So I'm going to skip through a little bit. I'll go to uh, it is page eight, page eight and nine of the. So we're going to talk about the school-wide strengths and areas of growth first. Um, this is what this committee found through their several days of meetings and interviews and reviewing documents. These key strengths. The entire GLC SBSC staff is very committed to creating a highly personalized learning experience for every student, resulting in meaningful opportunities that enable each student to reach their highest level of learning potential. Uh, this was no surprise to us, of course. Long-term relationships between GLC SB, SBSC staff and the families they serve address the need of the whole child and create a safe trusting environment resulting in far-reaching benefits for each student. And the vast standards-based curriculum and multiple scaffolded learning experiences ensures that all students meet grade level standards as they prepare for post-secondary life. So what they're highlighting is our teachers and staff are committed to this. The relationships between staff and families is strong and we have a wide array of resources that we can use to personalize our learning. So we were not surprised by these strengths. These are the things that they saw too. So let's move on to areas of growth that they highlighted for us. So like critical areas for focus. So these are, uh, these are, these are things that uh, through the sort of lens of the WASC criteria are really, really important for us to address. And the reason that I'm talking about them isn't just you know because of my involvement with WASC, but also because our next step is to use this as one of the um, one of the sort of resources and one of the one of the bases for developing our, our our LCAP, right? The actual plan that the school will follow in its program. So first, to align the school-wide learning out, learner outcomes with the school's mission and vision to create cohesive planning and monitor the progress of the students in school. To break that down a little bit, what they're saying there is make sure that the things that you're doing are in service of clear, shared, stated, and repeated goals for students. Those school wide learner outcomes. What is it that we expect our graduates to know and be able to do as they enter the world? What are the things that we expect that an education at GLC SBSC will imbue and provide? And then make sure that all the things that we're doing are deliberately connected to achieving those outcomes. Um, so this means that we, we have some services and some supports that are available, but they're, they're in place, but they're not deliberately connected and there's not part of a cohesive plan to keep them all in service of those same things. So that's recommendation number one. Second, develop, integrate, and implement data-informed decision-making practices on a regular basis. The targets and monitors LCAP goals focus on a culture of academic growth and high achievement for all students while involving the entire school community in the process. Okay, wow, there's actually a lot there. Um, but what that basically boils down to is once you have your sights clearly on the outcomes that you're looking for for students, monitoring your progress to achieving those, choose what data matters, right? Choose which assessments, which evaluations, which surveys, which pieces of information matter that we can look at and say, are we succeeding or not in achieving those outcomes? Make sure that our documents, particularly our LCAP, is in service of those things too. Um, and then while we're doing that, we can't just be in our, in our little caves working on it um, ourselves. We have to involve everybody. Everybody needs to be part of that conversation, which starts with everybody being involved in those school-wide learner outcomes, developing those. And then third, continue implementing programs and practices that provide social emotional support for all stakeholders. Um, this is the closest thing that the committee came to uh, an actual program element that they wanted to make sure we emphasize, which is the social emotional support for students, which we know uh, right now, especially is critical. 
And that's something that needs to be uh, made strong, made deliberate, and uh, communicated thoroughly and well and integrated across the program. Does anybody have any questions or um, things that they would like to clarify at this point? And it's fine to say, okay, what is a WASC, right? Because then these things that, that can happen, right? I, I've been in these acronyms. Um, side note, so the, an email went out a little while ago that had work anniversaries, and I saw my name next to the next to the phrase 18 years, and I had a little bit of a of a of a panic attack, a heart attack. I was like, it's been 18 years. So anyway, I've been 18 years in all of these acronyms. So if you're if you're not familiar with everything that I'm saying, feel free to stop me. Um, it, it can be helpful to sort of circle back around and make sure that I'm being really clear. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next um, element of what they, they shared with us. So these are, these, these four bullets are essentially strategic elements, practices to put into place to make sure that we're uh, pursuing those things that we saw in the, in the previous slide. Uh, the first one is continue to use stakeholder feedback, right? Using surveys, using this meeting, this group, conversations with you guys, um, and PLT conversations with families and use that feedback in our efforts. Continue to develop and integrate data dashboards that inform stakeholders and goal team and progress. So this is one of those bridges that's recently built that has a whole lot of potential that we're really excited about. Um, and that it's it's our, our staff's ability to put the data together and express it publicly in a way that is helpful for everybody to understand what we're doing. And everybody, once we have a, a shared understanding of what are the actual outcomes that we're looking for, these data dashboards, these, these pictures of progress, uh, will make it clear how far, how far along are we on these different goals. Third, implement professional development that supports the evolving school-wide learner outcomes and major student learner needs, uh, which means as we're establishing what those outcomes are, as we're making sure that our plan is totally aligned to those things, that is going to necessarily emphasize some elements of our teacher's role and de-emphasize others. So professional development means let's make sure that we build up the skills that are gonna be critical in delivering those outcomes for the folks who are gonna be responsible in large part for supporting families, for monitoring progress towards those outcomes on a student by student level, that means our teachers. And finally, continue to identify a broader array of opportunities for parents to engage in experiences that will prepare them for, I'm sorry, a broader array of opportunities for students to engage in experiences that will prepare them for post-secondary life. That's internships, college fairs, job fairs, community volunteer programs, gap year programs, and dual enrollment uh, to support the college and career readiness culture that we're seeking to really uh, develop um, in both schools. So those are the those are the major findings, the major elements uh, that the visiting committee um, identified for us. I'm going to show you quickly and skim through and not read through all of them. Um, in the WASC process, though, there are there are five areas that they cover, and each of those has its own set of strengths and areas of focus. Um, after this meeting, I'll make sure that everybody in the council receives a copy of the PowerPoint and you can look at these a little bit more closely and, um, when you have some time to do that. But first, so the, the first criteria is the organization. So they've identified areas to celebrate and areas of focus in the leadership, the organization, the way everything is structured. Next up is curriculum. There's areas to celebrate and areas for focus there. Learning and teaching, this is the, the part of it where the PLTs and instructor, instructors and facilitators come in. Assessment and accountability, this is where testing, measuring progress on a student by student basis and school wide comes in. And finally, school culture and support for student personal, social, emotional, and academic growth. So each of these has their areas of celebrate and areas for focus. And when our, uh, when our meetings continue and I'm talking with you guys about the development of the LCAP. It's going to be really helpful in that process uh, for you all to have a sense of um, what the priorities are on those outcomes, 
where there might be some issues already that need to be addressed so that we can really clarify what are the top one, two, three goals of our school for the next year. And uh, that is as much as I wanted to make sure I shared with you today. Um, are there any questions about any of that? I'm gonna leave it on this slide because it's the best one. Okay, so if there's no questions on the WASC, I believe that was just for update um, and discussion. So we can move on to C. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, so C, update and discuss the um, state assessments. And that's from Tamara, Director of Educational Services and Angela, our EL coordinator. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good or good evening, almost. So thanks for having us. Thank you for being here and serving. So I just, uh, Angela and I just wanted to come and just do a quick overview of the state assessments that are required for our charters. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm good to share, Kim, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, as we go through this, just let me know if you have any questions. So this is a state template of the 21-22 state assessment. So I'm going to cover um, just all the general assessments and special ed assessments. And then Angela will talk a little bit about the English learner assessments. So just feel free to jump in if you have questions. So this template I thought was really helpful just in terms of understanding um, the assessment names, what grade levels um, we have to assess. And um, I'll kind of talk a little bit about each one and, and I'll send you a copy of this. And I was wanting to maybe get some feedback too, if this is something that you think that would be helpful to the parents and just uh, making improvements in terms of communicating to parents um, the expectations for assessments for our charters. So. Let me know your thoughts on this. Um, it does have a little key up here for you to look at to see what the, all these little acronyms are. So um, as most of you know, we do do the summative, the Smarter Balance, Smarter Balance Summative Assessments, which is English and math. And there's two portions. And one's a computer adaptive test and the other is performance tasks. And that's for grades three through eight and 11. And we also do the science assessment and that's for five, fifth grade, eighth grade and one year in high school, our students do that. So if anybody, does anybody have any questions? I think most of you are pretty familiar with this. So just, just jump in if you have questions. Um, we currently don't have any um, Spanish assessments assigned for any of our students, um, that could change <laughs> here pretty quickly. So this would be typically for um, a student that's a non-English speaker. So at this time, we don't have any. Um, California alternative assessment is one of the assessments given to special ed students that have more severe disabilities. So it, it adapts the uh, test um, and it's given to them one-on-one, -on -one, the students that qualify for this. And I believe we have, we used to only have a few students that did this assessment, but we have quite a few actually for this school year. So that I wanna say it's, um, I mean, it's always less than 1% of our special ed population but I believe we have like 15, 15 or 16 at this time that will be doing that. And they do um, the alternative assessments, they do English, math and science. And it's the same as the summative assessments, third through eighth and 11th grade. And then the science portion is fifth, eighth and once in high school. And this year we do, we did the interim um, for, as a qualifier for title one. And then also the interim was given to all the special ed population. And uh, each one of these assessments 
we're working towards a 95% participation. So any feedback on any of those? If not, then I'll let Angela kind of review. Uh, we are just one last thing I want to talk about a little bit, which I know you're probably all aware of is that we're going to be doing the summative and the science test remotely this year and the teachers will be giving the test to their students at home. So the teacher will be at home, the students will be at home and the PLT will log in and test all of their students at one time. So typically it could, I mean, some teachers only have like six students they have to test at one time and some have like 20 to 25. So uh, I'm looking forward to see how it goes. I'm sure our teachers might be a little bit nervous, but I think it's going to go well. We've already kind of had a trial run with the interim, which is very similar. So any questions? Tamara, are those tests that are coming up that are going to be online, um, are, will they be broken down like by subject, like per day, or how will that be broken up? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I'll give feedback. I've given the teachers some suggestions and also ETS that, um, you know, the educational testing system also makes recommendations on breaking it apart, you know, like given, you know, like not doing all of math in one day or all of English. So I, I'll make recommendations. If you have recommendations of how you would like to see it done, I'll, I can take that back to the teachers as well. So we're kind of letting them decide how to break it apart. Um, but any, any feedback on that would be appreciated. Our so biggest... Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say our biggest thing is just so that it's not so overwhelming for the students is just not to have too much on one day. Yes. So yeah. um, the I would recommend and I've emailed the teachers and we're going to be doing lots of training with the teachers, too. And um, if you have special like if you want to um, talk with your teacher about scheduling, I would definitely have the parents reach out to their um, PLT as well and talk if there's um, a student that needs it broken up even more, like maybe the teacher can set up additional sessions. But the way we're doing it right now is they'll, the teachers will pick three days that they're going to do the assessments and they'll spread the test over the three days like we normally would do if they go to the test site. So they'll do like one day they'll do the English portion, the computer adaptive piece, then they'll do um, the like another portion, like maybe a part of the math, like part one to math, which is the computer adaptive for math. So that's kind of, we're leaving it up to them to decide. But I think too, with it doing it this way, it, it leaves it flexible. So, but we're not setting it like where they have to do it a specific way. Um, it might be a good idea for teachers to just check with their group of parents that they're going to be testing the kids and have them, uh, you know, get some feedback from their parents and say, okay, how, how would you like it scheduled? So that's kind of where we're at with it. It's basically kind of how they do it if they go on location. So if there's, um, except for some students in special ed, if, they're, if they have one-to-one -one testing, then the teachers will set it up where they do it on different days than when they test the rest of their students. Hopefully that answers, that answers your question. Okay. Let's see. I did also just thinking back to my email to the teachers, like the students shouldn't be testing for like more than um, like do like two hours or an hour and a half and then take like a little break and then do maybe an hour and a half to two hours, like no more than four hours in one day. Um, you know, if a student, like let's say a student signs on and then it's too much, they could message the teacher when they're in their remote, you know, because each teacher will have 
all their kids, but the kids don't see each other. And so if a student, you know, needs to stop for the day or something, the test can be paused and the teacher could reschedule or the student could start up the next day of testing. So there are those options as well. Like if a student's getting to a point where they're just like shutting down, we rather have them pause the test. And um, I think February 22nd will be our first day of training for the teachers. So I'll bring that up to the teachers and, and remind them that they can do that for their students. Okay, so let me go, I'll flip to the next one. And then Angela is gonna talk, um, Angela Arredondo is with us. She's gonna talk about um, kind of just give you an overview of the LPAC assessments, which is for our ELs. Hello. Okay, um, so for our English language learners, we have the LPAC tests. Um, there's a total of three of them. Uh, there's the initial LPAC, and LPAC stands for English Language Proficiency Assessments for California. So we have the initial LPAC, um, and this is the test that all EL students take um, when entering the EL program. Um, they Once they take the assessment, they're either classified as English learners or they're classified as um, initial. Um, um, they're called IFEP, uh, Initial uh, Fluent English Proficient. So um, this test, it does test them in listening, listening speaking, reading, and writing. Um, and it's broken down um, based on the student's grade level. And it is administered throughout the year. Um, so if we get students who start later in the year, then, um, then you know, they'll still be given the initial LPAC, even though they didn't start at the traditional beginning of the school year. Um, we also have the summative LPAC, and that test is given to all of our English learners. Um, it does uh, test them in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, and then it is for all of our learners, and it's broken down again by grade level um, for K through 12. Um, and we actually, it, they do include TKs in there as well. And it is um, given every year. And we are currently in the testing mode for our selective LPAC. It started on February 1st, and it'll go through May 31st. Um, and our uh, wonderful ELD teachers work with the parents and the students to set up a testing time um, and a testing date so that we can um, test all of our EL students. And our final uh, LPAC test is the alternate LPAC. And this year it is the operational field test. And we did have one student, this is our first year that um, we've been able to administer the alternate LPAC. So we did test one student and it went very well. And um, this test is specifically for students who have um, the most significant cognitive disabilities um, who are just identified as English learners. And um, it also has to be designated in their IEP um, that they are um, designated to take this assessment. And um, this year it is offered, uh, it started November 1st and it'll go through September or February 15th. Um, and all of the tests are computer-based and the summative, um, it is computer-based uh, computer uh, for K through two. They do take a paper pencil um, portion of it for the writing, um, but other than that, everything else is computer-based. So those are the three assessments for our English language learners. Cameron, do you want to go over the PE tests or is that, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. I'm clicking, I was like clicking the wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, the only other assessment, and it was suspended the last two years, was the physical fitness test. So we are going to be administering the physical fitness test this year for our students. Um, so it's fifth, seventh, and ninth graders. 
So I'm going to be working with um, a few testing coordinators to set up locations that our families can go to. So there's quite a few logistics that I have to figure out with that, but we will be doing that. Um, I'm thinking of shooting for May once we're done with our um, summative assessments. So like the, like we'll be past the April testing and then May we can focus on AP testing and the physical fitness test. So I think that was it. If anybody has questions, we can answer any questions. If not, then we can move on. Tamara, the only other suggestion that um, Blake and I have is for you to remind the PLTs when they're doing um, the testing is to let each student go at their own pace and not rush them. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yes. No, great. That's awesome. And with remote testing too, it's um, the way it's set up is that the, the teacher can see all of their kids, but the kids can't see each other. And then the proctor, the teacher can talk to the students live or through a chat. And the, if the student is taking more time and other kids log out, that's fine. So yeah, I'll make sure to remind them several times about that and letting the teachers know too, to let the students know that it's not timed. So yes, definitely, definitely. I will. Thank you for bringing that up. I'll remind you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Great suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Tamara and Angela for that. Um, if there's no other suggestions or discussions or questions on testing, then we can move on to D, which is information or updates and discussions on the EL program. And that's also Tamara and Angela. Okay. I'll try to get through this so that, um, cause I know I wanna leave time for Kim. So have Angela, our EL coordinator, go through this. Sorry. I'm just not very good with technology at this point today. So Angela, go ahead and you can take the floor. Thanks. Okay. I apologize before I start my little puppy. He's barking back there. So if you hear dogs in the background, that's why. <sighs> okay. So um, this is a, just a really quick uh, kind of like in a nutshell um, presentation about our English learner program uh, for this school year, the 21-22 school year. Um, next slide. We do have a great staff. Um, I am the EL coordinator and we have wonderful uh, ELD teachers. Uh, we have Tina Su. She uh, services the GLC portion of our program and our students. And then we have Carrie Holoviak. Uh, she is our other ELD teachers. She services the SBSC side of the program and students. And then we have, we're all under the guidance of uh, Tamara Campbell, um, our director of ed services. Next slide. Okay, um, so the importance of an EL program, the reason why we have an EL program is um, to make sure that our students, our EL students, are proficient in English and we get them there as quickly as possible. Um, our ultimate objective is to have our EL students become active participating citizens who are comfortable in both English and their native languages. And we specifically um, focus on improving skills in um, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, and it is a federal and state mandated program. Next slide. Okay, so how are EL students identified? Um, when students are enrolled in our school, um, they have to fill out a home language survey. And if any of the first three questions are answered in a language other than English, then um, they are put on our, our to be determined list and they are given the initial LPAC, um, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And that determines if they are an English language learner or if they quote unquote, tested out of the program. So um, they are first identified that way. 
And then also if a student was classified previously at another school um, as an EL learner, then our school of Corman is um, legally obligated to honor that classification. Because uh, we do get students who are who come to the school and they're like, well, I'm not an EL, my student's not an EL learner. Um, and so we have to make sure that we go back and look and, and see, because um, if they were uh, classified at their previous school, then we have to honor that. Okay, um, I just touched on this a little bit before. Uh, I talked about the three different um, assessments that our students take. Um, it's the initial LPAC, summative, L, well, initial LPAC, the student will take once. Um, and then we have a summative LPAC. And um, if a student qualifies, then they will take the alternate LPAC. Uh, all these tests currently for this school year are administered remotely. Um, so the ELD teachers are in contact with parents and students um, currently uh, to set up our testing dates and times for the summative LPAC. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, and what programs and services are offered to our EL students? Currently at Gorman, our, um, our students, they will take their English language development instruction and how it's provided to our students is that our TK students um, take reading eggs or they're enrolled in the reading eggs computer program. Um, our K through two students, they are offered um, Edmentum exact path and um, all of our instructional programs, they are computer-based and accessed remotely. Our wonderful ELD teachers, they're the ones that monitor progress. And if you know, there's any questions or um, communication um, with the PLTs on how the student is doing um, or with the parents on how the student is doing, that is done with our um, ELD teachers, um, as well as you know, they're wanting to make sure that the students bridge the, the learning gap. Um, so that's a little bit what, that's only a little bit of what our ELD teachers do. Um, unfortunately, they're part-time. Um, we would love for them to be full-time just so that they, they can offer, we can offer more to our students, um, but they do a great job with the little hours that they have. And our students, they also are offered our ELA and ELD standards-based curriculum. We have um, specific bundles um, that our EL students um, can um, or can use for their curriculum for English language arts. And um, the students also um, in grades six through 12, we offer a mental courseware for our EL SPED students. So those are just some of the services and um, programs that we offer our EL students. Okay, and before we get to the Q and A, um, we are currently um, looking for uh, parent representatives for our advisory council. Um, they need to be EL parents, um, and we want to get them more involved in um, our program and to have more say. So um, we will be sending out an email to all of our um, Gorman uh, counterparts to make sure to invite them to participate um, in our advisory council. Um, and if you happen to know anybody who would like to join um, as an EL parent, um, he, please feel free to, you can contact me and I can do that together. Um, but yeah, and, and, and if you have any questions, um, we just wanna thank you for your dedication to our English learners. I wanted to mention too, I should have started with this as um, our, when Denise put our advisory council together and we all talked, we combined all our, our councils together. So our English learner advisory council is part of the advisory now. So um, like we'll bring things to the advisory council through the year and then at the end of the year and get your feedback. Um, you know, maybe you might hear things like pros or cons of what we're doing. And we would like to hear back from the council. If there's things that you've heard that are great, that's great. If there's things that you've heard that we need to improve on, 
we want to hear. And so this is also an opportunity for us to update you so you know what's going on and what we're doing and what we're planning. So, and then Angela um, introduced, and I think Olivia, you could go to the next, um, unless somebody has, if anybody has questions or comments, then we could move forward. Yeah, so we can go ahead and move forward to E if there's no questions, because um, Angela sort of put a plug in for EL parents, but um, we'll go ahead and let Tamara. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll just go right. recruitment of EL parents. Yeah, so I'll go right into that. I'm um, just really quick because I, I want to give uh, Kim time here to do her thing. So um, basically, we did have two um, EL parents on the council last school year. Unfortunately, they're no longer with us. And so we are going to be looking for a replacement to EL parents from each charter. So we have already, uh, we'll be sending something out, but if you have any feedback or anything on that, but since we combine the ELEC committee with our advisory council, we do need to have EL parents sitting on the council. So when we bring things that do need approval or feedback that we have the EL students represented. So any questions about that? We were gonna send out, uh, a notice to all the EL parents to volunteer their time. And if we have more than four parents, then we'll need to bring it back to the council for a vote. So I'm just hoping we get a few at least. So, but we can have up to four. That's just, a, just an update for you all. Thank you. So we need to find some EL parents within our, our midst. Um, any discussion or questions on that? Or can we move on to F? Time. Thank you, Tamara and Angela for those, that information. So F, um, review discussion and approval of comprehensive school safety plan. And this is a plan that's updated for this year and Kim's gonna present it to us and then we need to vote on it and approve it and then she'll take it to the board uh, Thursday for theirs. You're on, Kim. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to try to wrap this up in a nutshell because it's a lot of language that's just kind of languagey. <laughs> but essentially, we're required to have two comprehensive school safety plans for Gorman, one for each school. They pretty much mirror each other. Um, and in fact, they mirror like eight other documents that I have to create for the state, but only these ones you guys have to read. <laughs> the other ones I just copy paste and send to the state level. Uh, but essentially we do this annually where we update them. And as you'll notice, the two documents are a little bit different between each other. I sent them last week so that you could have time to read the 75 and 85 page documents because they're very long. So I'm not gonna go through them step by step Essentially, the GLC-1 covers the Antelope Valley Resource Center. Um, this resource center and this comprehensive school safety plan is very unique in that this resource center is blessed to have an employee who was previously employed by a brick and mortar for safety. So they actually um, created an amazing plan with a lot of paperwork involved and everything because uh, she's been working with the traditional school system. So she was able to implement a safety plan that's a little more traditional for them. Uh, so you'll see that this plan actually has a lot more of the physical bags, the physical forms. They have um, an emergency preparedness area. Uh, again, that's a blessing of them having a huge campus out there where they can do this. And uh, so that's been fantastic. She went through and overhauled theirs with paperwork and everything. Then on the other one, this one has two resource centers on it. It has the Redlands Resource Center and the Santa Clarita Resource Center covered by it. And this plan is actually less paperwork driven, but that's because these guys have already started working towards our digital solution, which we are implementing this year a little hardcore. Um, part of that is because unfortunately Redlands is right above my head. <laughs> so they get to be part of me messing with them and their drill status as we're going through this. We do require extensive drills throughout the year for them. They're required to know policies. They're required to go through all of their evacuations and things like that every year. And I have been working on a digital solution with them 
for a little over a year now. Um, COVID kind of slowed us down because without any kids, you don't know what chaos it's going to look like <laughs> when you run a drill. <laughs> so we've only been able to discover in the last few months what it looks like to do a drill through this new system, which I am actually going to share with you because I think it's really, really cool. And I want you to see what it looks like. So let's see if I can get my screen share real quick to show you my phone. And we have Techie Kim who has her phone hooked up to her computer. <laughs> We're gonna see if that's awesome, Kim. <laughs> um, is it showing? Can you guys see? I don't know. Can you can you guys see my yes, phone? We can see. Yes. Yay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I like to be techie. So what we we know sometimes um, emergency solutions with anything that happens, there's a lot of things to try to remember, right? You grab the backpack with that has the emergency kits, the band-aids, the, the triage, the everything in it. Um, and then you try to also remember all the paperwork that you might need that you hope is still in the backpack from the last time that maybe you needed it um, and things like that. And one thing we've discovered is what's one thing I'm gonna say 95% of us don't forget anymore. It's your cell phone. <laughs> it's in your back pocket. It's in the pocket of the jacket you're wearing. It was sitting on your desk, whatever. The other thing is a lot of our facilitators in our actual locations have moved from a desktop computer to either a laptop or a Chromebook or an iPad. And because these devices are now easily picked up and taken with you, we can implement a digital solution that allows an emergency alert to go out instead of through our old PA or phone system um, through these devices now that are a little more portable. So uh, now we can have a portable device that is a school assigned device or their personal phone if they so desire that receives automatic alerts and lets them know there's an emergency situation. What's also nice about this is that team members themselves can report an emergency situation. So let's say, just for an example, that I am a facilitator. Nope, I lied, I'm gonna be a campus safety monitor. I'm a campus safety monitor and I'm walking around the building and I notice that there is one of these scenarios that pops up. There's a student fight going on outside. There's an irate parent or as often happens, unfortunately in our Redlands location, maybe there's a transient fight that has broken out somewhere near our campus. Um, I can actually push one of these uh, team assist buttons and select members who are trained to respond to those scenarios are alerted within moments. It comes off as a, a ringing or a large beeping depending on their settings on their portable device. So if you're a front desk person and you receive this notification, you know, let's say I push the um, irate parent one because uh, there's something going on in the parking lot the front desk person is going to receive a notification notification so that they can keep the parent from entering a space where there are students present. And they're going to be prepared for when that parent enters that space. Or they might lock the front door if it's unfortunately a transient or someone that might be threatening to students. This is great too for any time that we have an active shooter or um, anything that might be physically threatening for our students. We can keep them out of that space by alerting our front desk or our emergency personnel within moments. So this is the technology that we're moving into. And you can see that reflected in the plan for um, Santa Clarita and Redlands because they have less physical documents, but all of their documents are in here. So like you can see drills are right here. So every time they do a drill, they initiate it from in here. So um, this here is where you would initiate your drills. And this actually makes it so that I can keep a digital record and a digital footprint, which is nice because it archives automatically into a digital location. So no matter where I am, should the county or the state require documentation for Cal OSHA or any of the OSHA um, officers were to contact me or even our fire department or local uh, professionals, who are first responders, if they say, are you running the appropriate drills, I can pull these archives up from as far back as how we run this system. So uh, I do have two years worth of information in there, but obviously because we've been implementing and cleaning up our data and get it going, a lot of those archives show kind of our tester drills. So this year's drills are our actual like, hey, we've got it. Um, and it's really cool because we can check students in 
When we do evacuations um, for a fire, we can take them all the way out and we can say, we are not, I've got all these students that were in my workshop. They're now out here lined up with me. I can check them all in and now they're archived into the system for attendance, which allows us to now um, be completely compliant with the Cal OSHA school requirements for drills that are being run. So those are just a few things. I could go on forever about this really cool thing. Each of these buttons is um, a very fancy button that does a school-wide alert for if you need to do an evacuation or a shelter in place, a secure the perimeter or a lockdown. And all of these are just fancy ways of saying, you know, um, what do our facilitators need to know quickly? And that's what I really like about these features is that each of these buttons tells information to the facilitators in just that quick um, what's going on instead of the PA system. So we're slowly moving into this system and moving away from the PA system. Um, what's also nice about this, some of you may be aware, but as active shooters have evolved, they've created certain difficulties for us, uh, like where they've pulled emergency alarms on the walls and things. So now for fires, we don't immediately evacuate the building we wait for confirmation that there is a fire before evacuating students, um, no matter what location you're at, just to kind of give a couple moments to breathe in case there is a physical threat outside that we should be concerned about. So having something like this in our technology that you can't just sign up for, you have to be a designated team member, which is a little more of a controlled environment. This allows us to make it a little bit safer um, because not just anyone can activate emergency procedures for our employees and students now. So those are the two documents that we're looking at. This is where we're heading. The documents include a bunch of um, policies and procedures as well that are required by the state. So those are board policies and things that I cannot change. Uh, they have to be changed by the board of directors, which is you know, pretty much just all I can do is um, show you guys what we have available. And that's what I've done is included in the document that which is uh, board approved already and available. So if you have questions, input, comments, anything like that, um, I would love to hear it because usually it's just me and three people who are amazing and sit and write things with me <laughs> for hours on end. So anyone outside of our heads, we appreciate your input. Otherwise we just need approval so we can take this to the board of directors. Blake and I have two, two things. Um, so one of them is regarding the drills. Something that we would like to see added into the safety plan is that parents be informed ahead of time, say maybe like the week before or even a few days before um, that a drill is coming up because the most recent drill that they had at his resource center, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of his friends was so startled that they were crying. And I just think, I mean, Blake was fine, but, but still it, it was, he was upset that his friend was upset. And I just think if maybe the parents knew ahead of time um, and then knowing their children, if they need to talk to them about it ahead of time, like, don't worry, it's going to be a drill. You're going to hear this. This is, you know what I mean? Yep. Like some parents could prepare their students if they feel that their students need it. We, we would really like to see that added in there. Yeah, definitely. And then we have one more. Um, okay. You didn't mention it, so I don't know if this is the time to talk about it or not, but you're talking about the entire document if we have anything, correct? Uh, yes. There are some okay. things I cannot change, but I will bring them up to the board of directors if it's something I can't do. Okay. So that was, our, that was one main thing. And then the other one is regarding the... Um, and this might be something you can't change. I don't know. But regarding the... Uh, student teacher interaction. Um, <clears throat> we would suggest that it be removed saying that students are not allowed to hug their teachers because we just feel that if a student initiates it and feels comfortable enough with a teacher that they would like to give them a quick hug, you know, that that shouldn't be something that's like punishable. And so that's our second suggestion, that it be allowed if, um, if the student would like to initiate it. So I will bubble that up to the appropriate people because I don't have any control over that policy, but um, our HR department and our board of directors does. So I promise to let them know that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. 
thank you for those suggestions. Does anyone else have any comment or discussion on the safety plan for either school? And if not, we can get a motion to approve. Um, and Kim, you can correct me if I'm, but it, it's like a fluid plan, right? Like things can be changed as we go. It's not. Yep. Um, so this plan is what's called a living document, which right. means that I can literally make changes anytime I want. <laughs> right. So but those suggestions, we... if they do need to change, then those can be made without having to get approval again. But every year it does need to be brought to the, the council, all stakeholders to have input and to um, give it our, our thumbs of approval. So. Wait, I thought at the beginning um, we changed the ag agenda to just talk about it today and not approve it. Am I incorrect on that? No, that F, was... F is an approval one. It was for D and E. It was for the assess the EL um, program and for the EL parent recruitment. Oh, okay. So are we voting now to approve the document as is without any changes? You actually can... It'll you can make a motion to approve with the drills change. The student teacher interaction is a board policy that I cannot change in the document itself. I have no authority to do that. Um, but I, you can approve with the changes of the, the little adding of parents be notified for the drills. Cause I so will go back in and put that in. Okay. And then the for motion, the it would need to be so motioned with those changes. Yes. Okay, so, and then Kim, for the other one, for the parent, I mean, excuse me, the teacher-student interaction, that's something that the board would have to do, but you will tell, you will suggest that to the board? Yes, so that is actually a board policy and employee handbook. Um, and so they have to go through their processes before it can change in here. This document's just an archiving of that document um, because the state requires it this document does not inform changes on those documents. Does that make sense? It's the other way around. Those documents have to be changed and voted on first before they can come back and influence this document. Okay. So then, yeah, I would definitely like to um, only, or, or like, like for us to vote on this with the change of adding the um, parents be notified of the drills ahead of time. Okay, so you want a motion? Yes, I'll make that motion that I just mentioned. <laughs> okay, so then we need a second motion to um, approve with the, the added changes and the suggestions for the board policy. I second, Blake. Thank you, Blake. Okay, so then if we can vote and I'll go down through our um, attendance, you can say, um, if you approve, Tisha. Aye. Uh, Trisha Graham. Uh, aye. Thank you. Blake Graham. Emmerich. Aye. Thank you. Linda. Aye. Uh, Kiwi. Aye. I approve as well, Olivia. Uh, and, and Trisha Schroeder. Aye. And if there's no um, nays, then we'll say that this has been approved. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Great information, knowing that our kids are safe when they're on campus. Um, so next thing on the agenda is items for next meeting. So Tamara, Adam, um, any of the administrators, is there anything that needs to be added um, to our next meeting so agenda? So I would like to add um, discussion of school-wide learner outcomes and discussion of LCAP goals. Those two are gonna tie together. Sounds good. Kim, you got that? The second one, or the first one was school-wide learner outcomes. outcomes. You're amazing. I don't have anything for March, but I will for April and May. I don't have anything to add at this time. Okay, Trisha, did you have, there was nothing, RDs, I think they're okay. Not at this time. Um, okay, so then the next um, thing on our agenda is to confirm the meeting place and the meeting time. So the date and time, do we have those dates? 
I believe it's March March eighth. Is it March eighth at four? Yes. Yes. Over Zoom. Yes. So that'll be our next meeting. Um, and then if there's anything else, then we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at five oh six. Appreciate everyone for coming and thank you for being a part thank of this. You. Thank, thank you guys you. for listening. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. See you next Bye. time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank watch you. The, remember to watch night. the Olympics at 530. We have uh, Maddie. Oh, that's Maddie. Yeah. Yeah. Maddie competes at 530.